okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm alive. I think that's what it just told me. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the chat. So this is, by the way, this is the first time I'm ever doing a live stream. It's very clear that I don't even know where I'm supposed to be looking. But uh, I have a chat open. Um, oh, I should switch it from top chat to live chat. Here we go. Scott, I can see, oh my god, perfect. Scott, thank you so much for showing up. Uh, I see a number that says that a few people are watching, but this is really strange because I don't really, here we go, Simon, thank you so much. Um, you can probably kind of figure out what is the delay like, and maybe you can actually tell me what do you think is the delay from me seeing Ethan. This, um, <laughs> I'm acknowledging people in real life. In real time, I mean, um, is this is cool. Oh, Jay, oh, we'll delay it a little bit. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think the delay might be okay. There's a, a few options where I can choose between like high latency or like regular latency and low latency. And I think that comes at the expense of quality, although they don't say it like this. Anyway, this is, <laughs> this is the obvious part where every first attempt at a new medium is talking about that medium, right? <laughs> But uh, I think we're like a few minutes ahead of time, so I will uh, I will wait a little bit. Let's before starting. And by the way, starting means it's all gonna be very casual anyway. But thank you so much for showing up. I'm as always very interested in uh, any feedback or any thoughts you had about how it went and what it should do. I'm not honestly even um, uh, I'm not even honestly like super knowledgeable about live streams in general or how they work or what are the expectations so we all kind of figure it out i don't know if you can hear that my that's my cat getting excited about me talking uh, what she thinks is probably to her um but yeah i will be looking at the chat and yeah here we go i can here's what i have uh 20 30 seconds thank you jeff yeah i i, I assume that's okay or normal, <laughs> uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna try not to make it super awkward, but please chat, please like let me know what's going on, ask me questions, uh, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, oh, I'm assuming it's other uh, Jesse or Kaya, thank you, or both, a good kitty. The kitty's not probably gonna get on camera in any way because she's very shy, but there's a little cubicle here. Oh, this is weird, I'm all reversed. Here, right here. And maybe at some point she will jump into it. So we'll we'll see how it goes. But uh, yeah, give me feedback. Uh, uh, I have a little bit prepared of a few keyboards I want to talk to you about. But I'm also like curious, what do you want to talk about? And uh, maybe we'll talk about the book a little bit. There's, uh, it's here, right? Oh my God, this is all reversed. It's here right behind me, the book. So teaser. This is incredibly hard to do when you're not mirrored. So I'm moving in this direction. Here we go. This is the book, right? Or it's actually all of the prototypes of the book. Oh, if I move away, it's actually gonna focus. Oh, you see my cat. This is uh, some strange gift I got uh, for Christmas, like a joke gift. But anyway, um, Piauka, shh. I'm with people here. I'm in a meeting. You don't comprehend any of this. Okay, so um, by the way, this is, um, I don't know how many of you follow a YouTube channel called Technology Connections. Um, it's really cool. I don't know actually what the guy's name is, but anyway, it's called Technology Connection and it's kind of nerding out on kind of different tech. Uh, I think it started uh, with a lot of audio video stuff like Techmon, but then moved on to like other sort of household items like a toaster or a, a heater. Anyway, if you can, uh, if you can, if you're watching that show, uh, you notice that the background might look kind of familiar. And the funny thing is that I, I bought this. This is like a regular um, uh, IKEA thing. I bought this just because I thought um, it would look kind of nice just to put like a bunch of random things. Like here's one keyboard, here's another keyboard, here's some like mad scientist kind of vibes. But then I realized I, without realizing, I 
recreated technology connections background because they actually have the same IKEA thing and they also did this cubicle stuff. So uh, there was like a funny, uh, what, is the, what is the name for that effect when you steal an idea and you don't realize you've done it? Uh, uh, there's a name for it. Anyway, um, uh, here we go. It's 10, so I think we'll give a few more minutes uh, uh, before we start, but yeah, as always, please chat, please tell me what you want to know. I, I can, here's, here's a little bit of a technology that I have at my disposal. I can type all over my face, uh, um, which is really not that impressive, I suppose. But here's, here's, I need to prepare myself here. Here's what I'm ty typing on. So this is a car, like, this is like iPhone pointing at my fingers. And this is the, I wanted actually mostly talk today about the few keyboards that um, I mentioned in my last newsletter, because why not? Uh, that's a newsletter that came out about a week ago and it's called like the worst keyboard ever made, which is sort of kind of more of a gimmick and joke than anything else. Uh, but, uh, so we're gonna cover a few of those. I think it's gonna be fun and I'm curious, yeah, let me know if you want me to try something or if you have any questions about the keyboard because this one is actually, um, this one is actually connected as I mentioned to this other computer so I can actually use it and try to type on it which you can see is super awkward because the layout is very different uh, than what I'm used to. But <clears throat> the weird for the keyboard, <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, yeah, so that's my plan. We're gonna talk about a few of those. If you at any point are interested, I have sort of a keyboard collection at this point, but it's a very weird one. Um, uh, I know there are actually at least <laughs> one person, Jesse on a, in a chat or here, that has like a much more impressive and I think much more coherent keyboard collection. Mine is just kind of mostly weird keyboards. Um, but if there's like one particular keyboard that you're interested in and I might happen to have it, I can grab it from my um, uh, from my collection. So that's always an option. But yeah, um, I see people starting to talk about this one. So the story here, uh, there's sort of a personal story and there's a, um, a kind of like a larger story of what this keyboard actually means to keyboards. And uh, uh, <laughs> the chat is really cool. It's kind of distracting. I'm still learning. So basically, I think uh, this is a keyboard that start that was kind of announced in Singapore, like maybe a decade ago, and it's called Ab Key Revolution, which uh, A or A B Key. I'm not sure. And the funny thing, the, the way I learned about it, I actually learned about it pretty, uh, pretty uh, recently, because at this point, you know, I have this database and I've been looking at keyboards for many years and I kind of thought I've seen it all, right? Or like seen most of it. And, and I, on, on a lark, I just looked up uh, weird keyboards uh, at Google. I don't know why. I don't know if I've done it before. And a, a few articles came uh, and one of them was why uh, f uh, I'm going to steal a phrase, friend of the show, uh, Benji Edwards. And he mentioned this keyboard. And, and I was curious uh, because it's just a strange looking keyboard. I look at this, you can actually split it. Um, so I was like, it sort of has elements of different keyboards. Um, you know, some of the split keyboards. Uh, it's sort of, I joked that it looked like, like a bad version of Keyboardio Model 1, like, because it sort of has like an organic shape, but it's also, I think, really, really ugly. So there was something like really, really interesting about it. And, and kind of long story short, I actually managed to grab one because I have a friend in Singapore and she helped me navigate like a kind of local version of eBay. And, and it turns out somebody still had it and it was incredibly cheap. Often those keyboards that are interesting, they're kind of like, they are cheap, nobody cares, right? You can get them on eBay for $10 or whatever, plus shipping. Um, and, and so I, I grabbed it, we transferred it here, and I have it now. It actually works, as you can see. Um, uh, and it's, its layout is, and by the way, let me know if you, oh, somebody's asking me how many keyboards do I have. I used to have a list and then I kind of stopped updating it. I'm gonna say between 100 and 150. 
which if you can see the size of my apartment, it's already a ridiculous proposition, <laughs> but uh, this is the latest edition. And you can see, I hope it comes clearly and let me know what is the quality. I hope you can read the keycaps uh, in this view, but basically it's sort of semi-alphabetic with some exceptions, right? And I think the idea is that you hold your um, small, your pinkies here, and then you hold your three fingers here and you type like this, right? So you have this kind of, it's not a home row as much as a home arc. <laughs> uh, again, sort of not dissimilar to keyboard, view, but much weirder. And then you have this sort of circular keys. And, um, and so let me try to type something and it's gonna be very awkward. So again, hello. Yeah. By the way, I'm not even like a great touch typist in on the regular keyboard. The funny thing is that like, I think my, one of my hands is much better at touch typing than my other hand, which I heard is actually kind of common, <laughs> uh, uh, or at least not uncommon, but, uh, okay, so this works, but basically you're supposed to hold it like this, and as far as I know, this keyboard was just sort of, you know, an attempt to redo QWERTY, which honestly happens probably every five years, since the invention of QWERTY in like 18, 1860, 1870, whenever that was, we're actually not quite sure. I think it's like late 1860s. There's always somebody who's like, I am fed up with QWERTY because QWERTY is bad, right? And here's all the reasons that QWERTY are, is bad. Here's my thing that's better. And I will tell you why it's better, right? It's either like here maybe the idea is that it's alphabetic, so it's easier to pick up. It definitely follows, you know, uh, your arms a little bit better when you split it like this. Uh, the idea of like using thumbs uh, for more things than just a space and nothing is, you know, it, it is a good idea, <laughs> right? Because like uh, our left thumb is basically completely unused in touch typing uh, because it splits a space with the other thumb. But basically, you know, so there's some kind of good ideas here. Are these rubber dome switches? Oh, well, I don't know. Let's see. I have a key puller. You will see how often I pull keys by... Okay, here we go. Let's see. Give me feedback on my technique. Yes. I don't know how much you can see this. Oh. It is a rubber dome thing. Um, it's probably to, exactly to be expected given what this aims to be. But yeah, it's, uh, so yeah, switches are, I just typed something, switches are kind of forgettable. The shape definitely isn't, and even the keycap shape is strange, right? Like look at those keycaps here, like you don't see that very often, but yeah, you, so the idea is basically, I think somebody was just like, I'm fed up with QWERTY, and that happens all the time. And somebody mentioned Dvorak earlier, and this isn't Dvorak uh, in as much that you know, I think this is much simpler, right? It's like mostly alphabetic with some exceptions. You can see the vowels right here. And I think that's common with Dvorak that a lot of keyboards actually put vowels under one hand because I think in English, it's very common that the vowel alternate, alternates with a consonant. So you get like faster movement. Uh, but this doesn't seem as well thought through as Dvorak, even though it happened like 70 years later or whatever. But um, it, I, so in terms of like, what it contrib like what it means personally for me, it's a fun thing that I'm, I think it's actually a rare keyboard generally, even though it's not that important or not that, int it, not that like sort of uh, crucial, uh, but it's a fun one. You can actually, uh, let me see. Uh, oh my, oh my God, I made, here we go. You can actually see it here. It has those like legs. I'm accent typing right now. Let me refresh. This is actually command on the Mac. So let me just find R, here we go. Um, but it is kind of a, kind of a fun, fun keyboard, right? Uh, but I think the idea of just sort of like, I think I know that this is, that my idea is better than QWERTY. There is something really interesting about that line of thinking. And Dvorak was a perfect example too, which is, first of all, QWERTY is actually not as bad as everybody assumes, right? Like it's, it's much more deliberate than people f assume. Uh, and it was kind of lucky in some way, right? Like it, 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 um, it ended up, uh, so first of all, we, we, we have no idea why QWERTY was done the way it was done 
because nobody wrote it down, right? When they were working on this first typewriter, it was sort of operating like, like a startup and people were not uh, taking any notes or writing anything down because A, they had to move fast Patents, they sometimes filed patents, sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they filed like weird patents just to throw people off the sand or they built like special weird products for patents. I'm not an expert there, but it's, it's very hard to reconstruct this history uh, if nobody's writing it down, right? So we sort of only in hindsight can try to figure out why QWERTY was done the way it was done. And it actually was intentionally done uh, to reduce uh, the possibility of collisions, but it was also done given the construction of the first typewriter, very peculiar construction of first typewriter, that it became sort of irrelevant just 10 years after it was invented, right? It had this uh, uh, type bars in a circle and they used gravity. So anyway, it was this, um, it was intentional and it also got a little bit lucky because when touch typing was invented, it actually ended up kind of working fine. But the funny thing about QWERTY is basically it's gotten popular. Right? And a lot of people who try to reinvent query, they, they don't kind of think about what does it take in just to change people's habits, right? A lot of people just think like, I want, I have this thing that I can mathematically prove is better than QWERTY or our logically prove is better than QWERTY, but I don't invest as much in thinking about what it would take to actually get people to move off QWERTY in real life. Right? Is it good marketing? Is it good PR? Is it a good keyboard that has the layout that we have? And actually Dvorak failed at this in many ways. Hey Joel, uh, I'm just waving to people that I kind of recognize, but, uh, uh, but I appreciate everybody who's here even if I don't know you. Anyway, so, uh, so I think this is like a great example of the story repeating itself where somebody was just like, you know what, I think I have a better idea than QWERTY um, and they didn't really maybe think through like, well, how do you fight with QWERTY, right? How do you fight with 140 or 100, almost 150 years of people, people's smaller memories being used to QWERTY and all of this kind of stuff, right? So we see over and over again that people trying to reinvent QWERTY, like iPhone was trying to ship with something else and they eventually went back to QWERTY because people knew that. Um, so it's this like funny thing. And here, you know, you have this thing that has, I think has some thought put into it, right? Obviously, like, this, is, this seems very intentional and, and interesting. The fact that you can kind of split it, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of split between here's the numpad, but here's the navigation, well, at least part of the navigation is on both sides. Uh, um, you know, that is definitely thought through, right? Like somebody actually sat down and, 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 and uh, uh, thought hard about this idea. But on the other hand, it has this problem that many uh, keyboards have, which is it looks very weird, right? It, I would actually argue this is an ugly keyboard. Of course, it's always in the eye of the beholder, but it is like, if you put it on your desk, you might not get the kind of attention you want, right? If you're a nerd, maybe you will be like, oh yeah, what is this? And you can tell the story that I'm telling or some version of that story. But, uh, but the other version is like, you know, it's sort of like, um, I think Jesse and I talked about at some point, it like, kind of like starts looking like a medical device, right? Like the color scheme, this sort of blue thing here, the fact that you can split it and you can raise it. It's like, it's like for some people, it's just like, I don't want to be seen with this on my desk. And I think that's something a lot of people don't even consider, right? And that's something that dooms, um, that might doom those keyboards, right? And, I, and it's also like, as a side note, it's a challenge with any keyboard that tries to help with people's having musculoskeletal issues, you know, what's tech, what sometimes we call RSI, is a lot of them, in order to be helpful, have to look very weird. And I have one, maybe if you're interested in, we can look at the safe type later. That's a very weird looking keyboard. And it's, there's a little bit of a stigma behind it, right? So it's, it's, you know, it's one thing to come up with the layout uh, and the sound practices and all of the stuff. And Dvorak did it, Colmac did it. What is the newest one that's, that I forgot, right? The one that's like half designed by AI. Um, uh, it's, uh, that's one thing, but the other thing is like, how do you get it out in the market? And I think that's the, that's, that's the challenge that a lot of people underappreciate. Um, uh, it's also, yeah, somebody's, David, uh, uh, you pointing out that it's also like this weird asymmetry, right? And I, I can't quite figure out why this particular column is not here. And I think there's probably a reason, right? But it also, yeah, it, 
I think it contributes to it feeling kind of weird. Um, but then again, like, you know, what do I know, right? Uh, I don't know exactly what happened to this keyboard. I'm actually surprised that this feels very final, right? This is not a prototype that feels like 3D printed or it is just like, I think, proper molds for all of the things and it looks like a product. Uh, work, workman, yeah, and it is like another one I think starts with an H that's like a, uh, well, maybe we can, uh, it sort of, says that it's half designed by AI, which is like an interesting concept, uh, or machine learning. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so this is the keyboard. Uh, it's strangely enough, it still works. Uh, so I can type, you know, let me try to type it properly and see. Um, um, of course, I'm gonna type my name because that's what you do. Um, fun fact, there was one uh, time, a uh, long time ago, when uh, just long before computers, when some, um, uh, you know, what, what happened quite often was a theft of typewriters, particularly from institutions and schools, because uh, typewriters were like, um, you know, high tech devices to some extent, right? Like good ones were pretty expensive. And so it was, it was nice to get, uh, uh, you know, stealing them was, was like a, <laughs> It was kind of like a, a strategy you could consider, particularly from places that had a lot of them, right? Um, and so there was this story that at some point uh, there were some thieves that stole a bunch of typewriters from school and they, they were, uh, they couldn't grab all of them. So they grabbed only like what they thought were the best ones, but they also played with the ones that they left behind a little bit, maybe probably to test, you know, if they're good, if they feel like they're in good shape. And what happened was, uh, one of the thieves did the thing that we all do, which is they literally wrote their name and address <laughs> um, on the typewriter. They grabbed the paper, of course, because you don't want to leave any traces, but they read it from the platen. They read it from the cylinder, you know, from the rubber cylinder behind the paper. And that's how they found, um, uh, like, who the thieves were, which I thought was really funny. Um, so, yeah, so obviously that's what we all do. We try to type our names. But yeah, do you have any, yeah, do you have any thoughts about this keyboard? Anything you want me to try or, um, I mean, it's a keyboard. It, all of this works as you expect. There are different types of keys. You know, there's this like rubbery ones. There this, this is thick, thick plastic. This is soft plastic. There's stuff happening here. Um, it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a strange keyboard. It reminds me a little bit of like Apple, um, adjustable keyboard, which was Apple's like first and only split keyboard in like mid 1990s, which also had like this keys and this keys. And uh, I think Microsoft Natural does the same thing and a lot of keyboards like it's just, but you know, this doesn't look great. Too many types of keys, um, looks like a medical device. Uh, I am um, would love to take a look at the safe keyboard if type permits, I see Leonard typing, yes. Uh, you know what? Uh, is it USB, this one? Yes, it is. It's it's a pretty modern one. It's USB-A. I have it connected to my computer without any, like, uh, magic translators. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, okay, I'm gonna pull it back. Actually, let's let's look at safe type. Why not? There's no, there's no reason not to do it. So I'm gonna disappear for a second, um, and I will get it from my... Uh, here we go. So here's the... Proof, oh, here we go. Here's the proof that this is USB. Um, yeah, it's just a strange, funny keyboard. And I think the fact that it's finalized, that it's like actually a real product, although I don't think, I don't know how common it was, that's the strange part. Like you don't ever, you don't often see it going that far. Uh, and actually Jesse, if, if you're still in a thing, you, Jesse has like a lot of experience going from prototypes to final product with his keyboard, yo, and it's like a lot of work. So in that way, you have to admire this one, right? That they actually took it to market, even though you could argue maybe they shouldn't have, I don't know, who's there to say uh, whose dream is worth pursuing? And I'm joking because I'm pursuing my dream of making a book, right? So that's the thing. My cat's meowing and I'm gonna get a safe type and I'm gonna be there in just a second. Fialka. Uh,
Well, you have probably heard all of this ruckus, but um, here we go. Here's safe tab. Don't be alarmed. Uh, it's a very strange looking keyboard. So this is also um, USB. I think it has two USB ports, which uh, maybe somebody can explain to me why. Uh, this one, uh, here we go. I don't know. I'm gonna try to connect, connect them. Here we go. We might see. Here we go. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, something's working. Let's see. Let's see where are the keys. So okay. Let me just type quickly. Here we go. All right. So that's working. Um, so safe type. Uh, let me just put it here and show you what it is. So safe type is basically a, one of the many keyboards that try to help people who have issues with their hands or shoulders or neck because of extended typing, right? And it, there are different names for it. Traditionally, we've called it RSI or carpal tunnel. Um, uh, there's the names keep changing. Some people call it like musculoskeletal issues or uh, issues around neck uh, and shoulders. There's a new name. It, it sort of highlights that this is actually a tricky subject to talk about because it's, it's complicated, right? It's not just like something happening in your wrist and sometimes not knowing what to do is the tricky part. But this is one of the solutions, right? And this is a little bit more advanced one. And the whole idea is that you know, normally when you type, whether you hold your hands like this or this, it's even worse because it's unnatural in two different ways. That exerts some unnatural kind of pressure on your body. But imagine like holding a light box in front of you. If I switch to my camera here, like imagine uh, that feels like a pretty natural position, right? If the box is light, obviously, like that feels like kind of natural. But so this is like a version of a vertical mouse, you know, in other words. Uh, it's a little bit yellowed, as you can see, but the whole idea is that you hold your hands like this and you type like this. Right. So this is, um, let me just show you a little bit what it looks like from the side. So this is like a pretty traditional QWERTY, right? The interesting part is uh, how, uh, you know, some of the legends are rotated and we'll get back to it in a second. But basically, you know, have your right hand side here, you have left hand side here. Again, it's yellowed, uh, and I'm not like sort of in a business of retrograding things, uh, although I could. Um, here we go. Let me remove the text because uh, it's kind of weird. Here we go. And the whole idea is, you know, yeah, you hold your hands like this, and then you type. Um, and it supposedly, you know, exchanges, you know, maybe some of the adjustment period for for you being more comfortable in the longer run, right? So uh, this is actually pretty clever because they, in a way, if they followed QWERTY, right? They said like, we're not gonna fight, we're gonna pick the right fight, right? So we're not gonna like exchange QWERTY for something else like Maltron did, for example. And eventually they had to ship QWERTY as well because people were asking about it. They said, you know, we're gonna, um, we're gonna do regular QWERTY. We're just gonna rearrange it so it's a little bit easier on your, uh, on your fingers and so uh, on your hands actually on your neck and shoulders not on fingers not so much because it's the same keys and you uh, and this is I guess like sec as you guys see all these different kinds of keys and here's the funny thing and you probably know this already uh, the mirrors yeah, oh yeah somebody I saw somebody say yeah don't forget the mirrors I just saw it so basically the idea is that if you're um, if you're learning how to type on it uh, it's kind of hard to see, right? Because your eyes are here and your hands are here. So the idea is that I'm gonna try to like position it the way, oh, oh, they keep flipping. Here we go. So basically the idea is that like you position it so you see kind of like what you see right now, which is you can actually see the keys, right? As you type it, it's gonna be, it's hard for me. I mean, I need like a third hand to do this. But imagine, you know, I'm typing right now here and then that's how you build this sort of understanding of where your hand is in this sort of new universe, you know, with like the third dimension, or not the third dimension, just sort of like flipped around. So yeah, so this is like a training device, right? Which is somewhat clever, right? Like you, you can, right now I see where my hands are, and this explains why some of the legends are rotated, because this is for me to look at through the mirror, not from the side. 
like like this. You know, so so yeah, it's kind of a strange thing. Uh, I don't know. You know, like many of those keyboards, uh, maybe somebody in the chat knows like how how popular it was. I don't imagine any of those keyboards are ever very popular, and that's also what makes them pretty expensive. Uh, and uh, because they're for a much smaller group of people, right? But you know, look at this cool space bar. It's kind of nice. Um, yeah. Otherwise, it's a regular keyboard. But again, there's this tricky part about you know, imagine this on the desk of your coworker. Right and how uh, you know this might look like a little weird, right? Even though this is a great keyboard for some people, presumably, and uh, it actually helps them uh, sometimes continue working, right? If your issues are like so severe that you need a little bit more of a, a, a different solution, um, but that's kind of like a challenge of a lot of those kind of keyboards. Is they um. So, so for example, the success of Microsoft Natural Keyboard, which I have also, but I assume a lot of you know, uh, which it's the most popular quote-unquote ergonomic keyboard, uh, and of course the definition of ergonomic is, is a, it's a gradient, it's a sliding thing because the, all the keyboards are ergonomic or none of them are ergonomic, depending on like you know how how, how you slice it. Uh, uh, the Microsoft Natural is the most popular ergonomic keyboard because it's pretty muted, right? It's just like a little bit slanted, maybe it has a little bit room, there's nothing to adjust, there's no levers, there's no sprockets and stuff like that, there's no mirrors, there's no strange shapes. And that's something that like, you know, a lot of people can swallow. It's kind of similar to like, I don't know, like driving a strange car or uh, I don't know, wearing strange clothes. Like, who's, like the word strange doesn't make sense because it's again in the eye of the beholder. But it might be tricky, right? It might be tricky, and I think that's like generally. Um, I think Apple went through the same thing with their like Apple TV remote, right? Where is this like fight between like what looks good and what's like aesthetically and graphic design and industrial design pleasing, and what's actually good for your hands, uh, or any gaming controller, right? I don't know if you like follow some of those. You know, Nintendo had a very simple one. A lot of them that like follow like your um the the shapes of your fingers or like how you grip they start looking very weird if you start you know so there's always this sort of push and pull um just yeah at one point the natural was the most popular aftermarket keyboard yeah yeah i didn't even know that yeah that's that's wild uh, okay i'm gonna look at the chat a little bit yeah there's a fingertip outline it, it's it's a strange uh it's yeah it's on the j it's like a much, much more prominent, but exactly, it, it sort of helps you because you're in this weird dimension, right? Like, you're, it's not like a regular keyboard. Uh, takes up a lot of volume, does it collapse for storage? Uh, not that I can tell. The, the only thing that collapses is the mirrors, as you can see here, but it is like a bigger, um, bigger one, a bigger keyboard, yeah, that's the thing, okay. Uh, all right, so Leonard, I hope this is, uh, this was fun. Uh, Somebody had, yeah, at the second USB port, maybe a pass-through, maybe for more power, but although why would this need more power, right? Nothing, there's nothing motorized here or strange. Yeah, let's look actually, let's see on the underside if, if we can flip it. Um, I just typed something by accident. Uh, so yeah, the Windows logo is a registered trademark. Okay, that's fine. But it says here, uh, oh, it's not even like proper grammar. First of all, it says soft type. I've never noticed this. So uh, this was maybe a last minute job because it also said typing awkward position or long periods may cause repetitive stress injuries or related injuries. Um, so strange grammar aside, uh, the um, uh, that's been like a, a thing that all of these ergonomic keyboards started having to say, which is like, you know, we're not actually... We don't have a proof that we solve RSI. We don't have like a, um, a, we're just trying to make it better, but we cannot tell you you're gonna be good because then we, you know, expose to litigation if we promise that we're gonna help your body, right? So I think a lot of those ergonomic keyboards and sometimes in very prominent places used to have this sticker saying like, hey, you're on your own. We're trying here, but you know, we don't know. And it's also, it's true because, again, RSI and all of these issues are complicated, right? There's so many things that could help you. 
And the strange thing about RSI, and I'm just gonna flip this keyboard, I'll just get out because this is a very strange position. Uh, I, I talked to a bunch of experts around, uh, you know, muscle, musculoskeletal issues and typing, and they told me, you know, this pain in general is very complicated. And, uh, and in many ways it's a personal journey and that's what makes it hard. But in a way it's also very complicated because like one of the best ad sometimes advice for RSI is like go on a good diet or like invest in a partnership with somebody who cares about you personally, like with a person, right? Get support from somebody, get a boss that doesn't hate you. Like those are like real things that can help like move your body to like tolerate more pain or like move the threshold of the pain below so you can deal with it. And that's what makes like RSI complex. I'm not really an expert. It's, it was one of the hardest chapters for me to write uh, because it's such a complicated issue with no easy solutions, right? But some of those keyboards like, like SafeType are at least trying to help people. And I think it's commendable, right? Even, even if, if, um, if I'm sort of making fun of their, not, I'm trying not to make fun of their appearance, but I'm acknowledging that their appearance might make them harder to adopt as well. Right. So somebody's asking, is that a Tommy behind you? Uh, and I think you're referring to this. And I think this is a Tommy. Yes, <laughs> you, you probably, whoever you are, who, who, Ethan, Ethan, you might know more about it than I do. It's, it, I just got it recently. Is this funny? It's a toy computer, right? And it's really, there's, there's no electronics in it. It's basically just, I think if I type on it, it just sort of advances the uh, the line and then it's just like sorry if this is very loud uh, it just teaches you basic things left and right perfect kind of political but we can move past it oh my god this is taking forever yeah so it's a it's a, it's a clucky toy I think Tommy actually genuinely made computers right and I think but I think they also made this like computer-like things to um, plane. This was a plane. Um, I guess it's good to know. But um, uh, it's adorable. Yeah, this actually, funnily enough, Ethan, thank you for mentioning. Th this will actually factor into some of the things I wanted to talk about later. So this is, in a way, uh, I didn't even think about it. This is, in a way, a training keyboard, right? So uh, maybe we can talk about training keyboards right now. This is all happening uh, organically. So this was this was one of the training keyboards, right? Like, uh, or maybe something that gets you more comfortable with computers. But here's uh, where was it even? Doesn't matter. We go plain. Um, here's what I wanted to show you. Um, again, from my newsletter, uh, there were like two calculators, right? So let me let me show you two of them. But I actually want to show you. A much more interesting calculator. So those are kind of, you know, there are like advanced calculators, right? They're like, uh, you can type uh, letters in all of them. So they have like alphanumeric keyboards. Uh, this one is obviously much younger. I think this is 2000 something. This is late 70s, as far as I remember. Um, this is, I think, the first uh, calculator where you can actually type uh, text. I don't know if you can see like their letters in blue. And if you switch to the alpha mode, uh, you can actually type on it. Um, it's a pretty like legendary calculator, um, uh, and it would help if I tell you what it's called. It's Hewlett Packard 41C or 41CV. Uh, it's I think that actually like my my font here that I use right here. It's sort of like an, an homage to the 14 slash 16 segment fonts of that era. You know, you can see them in pinball machines or uh, uh, or in electronics uh, from a certain time but yeah so this is this is a you know Hewlett Packard had this reputation at least at that point of being like a pretty good uh, computer maker and keyboard maker right like HP uh, what we would call today and you know uh, this one is kind of cool you know you can have overlays so I can actually snap something that both helps it like uh, survive like more harsh conditions like if it's in a factory or something but also you know it can change the meaning of the keys, right? And it actually had programs you can install here. Uh, I honestly don't know how to use it. I know it makes a cool sound if I do this. Well, it does sometimes. Here we go. Let me see. Hi, that's kind of cute. 
it actually has a thing called beep. I don't know if it means anything. Um, so I'm not smart enough to use it because this was like a professional calculator for, um, for professionals, uh, which is also a theme. Uh, so let's move it to the side. This is the one that I found very interested in, which is, you know, I think this is like a school calculator, right? Like a, like a, um, a, a, a I don't know if it's high school or whatever, but it's, a, I think there's a whole thing about TI having good lobbies, and that's why you see TI calculators in schools. Some of you know more about this than I do, probably. Um, uh, uh, oh, thank you for your story. Yeah, I, I'm seeing the uh, physics teacher. 41C, yeah, as, as far as I know, the 41C was like a genuine great device that many people used and admired. And a bunch of other, I think somebody else mentioned like a different calculator, 28C. Um, this is, I don't think, not as universally beloved, um, but what I like about it is, uh, oh, if you can play songs on it. Yeah, maybe it's for next time when I learn how to use it. This one has this like really interesting keyboard, which is um, like alpha numeric stuff goes in between other keys, which, uh, let me see if I can get it in a new document. I mean, it's much more sophisticated. Um, uh, how do I use this? I'm trying to, I'm trying to make it type uh, add add notes, here we go. So it has like a graphical user interface. So I can type like, you know, again, my name, I'm not gonna type my address, but um, you know, so it has this like strange thing. I think somebody mentioned, I posted, I posted about it and somebody mentioned this was also in a uh, use in a mobile phone. Um, uh, this sort of technique, you know, squeezing smaller keys in between larger keys, um, uh, but uh, you know, it's kind of strange. Uh, it's not as bad to type, except again, it's alphanumeric. And I heard the reason, or I in, I think the reason might be that QWERTY calculators are actually banned in schools because maybe the QWERTY means like it's professional and it has like some functions that maybe help with cheating or you can write programs. And so all of the school calculators have to follow alpha, like ABC layouts. I don't know. Uh, I haven't investigated that yet. But also, of course, query is harder in this form factor, right? Query is more com more uh, compatible with this because it has a bunch of longer rows. If you have a lot of shorter rows, the same thing with this one, right? It's easier, it's harder to do query because when you split it in the middle, then it feels kind of funny, you know? So um, uh, uh, I see a lot of people, yeah, a lot of love for, uh, yeah, I actually had a programmable calculator too at school and I programmed some things and I, Cheated. I mean, that's probably like the way of putting it. So anyway, this is like, you know, this is uh, this is just a funny solution to a very particular problem, right? Instead of having a mode or a layer with a modifier key or a toggle key, it just introduces like a physical layer in between. It sort of tries to cheat uh, the rules of space and time. I don't know why I said time. But anyway, uh, so this is funny, right? So this is, uh, this is a TI Inspire. Um, I just, you know, once in a while I just find this like, it was kind of the same story as the Singapore, the app key. I was like, this looks great. I, I just need to have it and see how it feels. So this was the thing. But what I really want to show you, and hopefully you will enjoy it, is a, a very different device or a very different calculator from a very different era. And we actually going to want to use it. And you will hopefully uh, use it with me uh, or test my answers. So, this might actually, oh, here we go. Oh my God, it's really heavy, as you can sort of probably imagine. Um, this is, you know, we kind of assume that calculators always had a 10 key keyboard, right? Or at least I assumed for a while because it's just like a natural way calculators look. But this is actually the original a calculator that was like the first one that was mass produced and actually worked well, right? Because obviously for any technology like calculators, typewriters, computers, there was there's a period where they don't work very well, right? Like some people are trying things, they're not working. And at some point somebody makes something that starts the industry or it's good enough and cheap enough or whatever are the right, right parameters. This is the Comptometer from late 19th century, uh, late 19th century, yeah. So it's pretty old. It's pretty much roughly at the same age as the typewriter, which started around the same time or became popular. And it's heavy, 
at its great. And this is the original keyboard of a, a they weren't even called calculators. People were called calculators, right? Like when typewriters came around, people were called typewriters and also people who calculated were called calculators and eventually we sort of split that. Anyway, this is, so this is how it works. And it has a lot of really beautiful little details. Uh, it makes it easy for us to dismiss it because it's like an old piece of technology and blah. But for its time, it's actually pretty wonderful. And I hope I can show you why. And I hope we can use it, uh, latency, if latency allows us. Okay, so on its paper, uh, on, its, on its face, like this calculator only uh, does addition. So if you, So this is the end result. Right, so uh, this could be used for uh, like insurance calculation, regular goods, weights, prices, whatever. Uh, they, those keys look like they are brittle. Uh, when if I'm, uh, yeah, I think those might be like um, early plastics, right? Like uh, bakelite, maybe something earlier. I'm not an expert, but yeah, definitely, uh, this is in a pretty good shape. Even uh, uh, even though it's yeah, here's chipping. I had to glue some things together, but anyway, so. Um, so this is the end result. I press one, it adds one. I press two, it adds two. I press seven, it adds seven. That's it. I just told you the whole thing, <laughs> basically. There's no like plus button. It all happens when I type uh, two, two, oh. I just added uh, 20 to 44, right? Uh, uh, I can, here, I can reset it to zero, right? So I, if I wanna add, uh, I don't know, uh, 579, and then I want to add 268. That's the end result. I, I, please somebody check me, by the way. I, I think it still works, but that's it, right? That's the thing. So, uh, uh, so in a way, it seems like a primitive machine. But first of all, um, uh, it had to solve this very, very complicated problem, which is this is a digital machine in an analog world, right? So for example, if I type like, what prevents me from like pressing one just a little bit, right? What prevents me from pressing like one and five together? What prevents me from like doing weird stuff? Nothing, right? And earlier calculators actually struggled with this. If you press it really hard, it jumped and started lying to you, right? You press three, but maybe you've gotten four uh, or, or they, just showing you bad results. And this one was engineered very, very carefully to never lie to you, right? It's gonna jam. Uh, there's actually a button here that it's hard to see. It's like a red button behind a nine. Uh, let me see if I can, here we go. It's an unjamming button. So I'm not gonna like pound on it really hard because I don't wanna destroy it. But basically if it enters a situation where it's like something weird happened, it's gonna stop working. And it's gonna tell you like, hey, I can't guarantee the results anymore. Uh, you have to reset me, which is very clever, right? Like it, it's, it, it guarantees that the results are gonna be good, right? So um, there are also like uh, many beautiful little details, right? So for example, you see that the cents are different colors, the thousands, etc. at the numbers and the thousands and millions, right? You can see that every other row is concave or convex. So it actually, it's sort of a predecessor to like, you know, homing keys or F and J, like, but like whatever, it sort of, if you do it often enough, you will very quickly know that your fingers are on the wrong row, right? Um, you see that if I start, uh, you know, I keep adding, you can reset it. Uh, and the first time I use it after a reset, it's gonna make a sound. And it's also for you, even if you're not paying attention, because eventually you wanna touch type on this, right? You wanna be looking at your numbers from a book and you wanna just sort of like, do it very quickly without looking. This whole machine is designed for touch typing or touch calculating. Um, uh, you, um, you, you will know, you can, with your ears or with your hands, with your fingers, you will kind of get a state of the device, right? So uh, I will explain, some people are asking about smaller numbers uh, and those like little things. I will explain them in a second, but, uh, and by the way, uh, this is where it gets really interesting. Like this seems like a very simple device, right? But it's actually, uh, you can do a lot with it and I'm actually not good enough. I'm not a trained comptometrist or calculator <laughs> to do it. Yes, subtraction pan is, but anyway, so here's the thing. So let's say you wanna add 555 to 123, right? You can do it this way, right? 123, 555. 
That's the result, right? I think, but if you're really good, you're doing it this way, right? You just use a lot of your fingers at the same time, right? And the calculator is, again, designed to allow you to do it quickly. Uh, so for, for example, here's like the most beautiful thing I'm gonna show you. So I just have like a, a big number. And what happens when I press one, right? Um, the funny thing is that like a lot of, this is, you know, you have to take one, switch it to zero and move it to the next one. But here you have to move it over and over and over and over again. And actually a lot of calculators struggle with this because now the force of my finger is like has to be carried across many digits. And some of those calculators, like you had to press one really, really hard to overcome the strength necessary to turn all of these dials all the way to the left. This one is just like, it's so easy. It's so beautifully engineered that it's effortless, right? It's the same press. It's, it makes sense in an electronic universe that every key would feel the same, but in a, in a mechanical universe, that's really, really hard to do. And they engineer it very, very precise. I'm gonna show it to you again because it's really fun. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna press, and I'm pressing it really lightly. Here we go, right? So it's, it's like one of those things that they had to figure out, right? So anyway, so you can see how um, you can add something very quickly uh, uh, by just like pressing it at the same time. And we're gonna try to do an exercise. Uh, so I, let's see how the latency works, but uh, I want somebody to give me two four digit numbers and I'm gonna try to multiply them, which is something we haven't talked about yet. So whoever sees this first, don't use zero because zero is kind of like, doesn't, doesn't even exist here because it's like adding zero means nothing, but two four digit numbers and you multiply them and I'm gonna try to multiply them. Helene, oh my God, hi. Uh, there's a lot of good friends here. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, uh, I'm gonna wait a little bit. I don't know what the sort of delay is up to, but the, the first time I see the two four digit numbers, I'm gonna tell you how to multiply them uh, because it's actually really fun. I'll take some water in the meantime. Okay. okay, I see one number. Okay, I see two numbers. So I'm gonna follow Ethan's numbers. So 8,756 and then 1,585, all right? So uh, I might fail at this, but I hope you appreciate the demonstration anyway. So uh, how do you multiply it, right? There's no multiplication function. This doesn't have any functions. It's basically, so uh, let's pick up, I'm gonna put my fingers on one, here we go. So. Actually, I can do it this way, right? So my fingers are right now on 1,585, right? And you've, we've already established that I can press them really quickly at the same time. And so check this out. So I'm gonna reset it. One, uh, I'm very nervous, by the way. This is like a, this is a professional use of this. Okay, 1,585. So I can press it once and it registers, right? But the way to multiply it is basically I press it many times. <laughs> so uh, six, I have to press it six times, right? So I press it once, two, three, four, five, six. So I have 1585 multiplied by six and I wanna multiply it by 50. I just move my fingers to the left and I do it five times. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Here's the result. Uh, if I didn't mess it up, it's 13,878,260, which you can see right here. And so it's a funny, I, I will wait, so somebody please confirm, but even if I mess it up, it's that's the idea, right? You basically, um, you basically uh, do it, it's, it's a sort of this, the synergy between the, the person and the machine, where the machine is not smart enough to do everything, but it's designed to help you do it quickly, right? Because doing things like this is basically what computers are very good at doing, right? Doing mindless things incredibly quickly. But this is still before computers. So this is, yeah, thank you, Ethan. Thanks for checking out. And the way I did it was very slow. If you get really good at this, you can go really, really fast. And that was the whole idea, right? This machine is designed for you to get really, really fast. 
So, um, a few small details. So, the way to do the way to do uh, subtraction. So we covered addition and multiplication. Right? The way to do subtraction is basically it has to do with the small digits, which is basically you add uh, sort of the reverse of it, right? So if you wanna let's say subtract 666, uh, you have to find it here, and then you press this. But uh, so you're basically adding 1,333, which is one off, but also you, you can. I'm not explaining this very well. This is this is where even I get a little bit too complicated. Basically, you, you're adding 1,000 minus that number, and the two tricky parts is that first of all you have to then add one, just because you're always gonna be off one. You know, 1,000 minus something. It's not 909. Like, oh sorry, you want 1,000, but you're gonna do 999. And then you have these buttons here, which basically prevent overflow, right? So if I type one here, I'm gonna get nine. But if I hold it, you will see 79. It gets 70, right? So I can prevent the carry and actually make it a subtraction, right? So it's it's a little bit more complicated. And honestly, I haven't tried it enough to even attempt it. But you have to trust me, right? This is kind of how you do it. Um, and uh, and division you already know right it's 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 the same thing we did with multiplication and the same thing you would do with subtraction combined so it's even more complicated right but so this is and this is this is where it gets interesting right so this was a professional machine right even though it looks very very simple it was a machine used by professional calculators right but professional people who did, like actually spent hours a day just doing this writing it in a spread like an old school spreadsheet with the pen and do it over and over again. So that's why it has all of these affordances for like professional power users. You can, for example, you can split it into two parts. You can do some calculation here and some here because the machine doesn't care how you use it, right? Uh, of course, reset resets everything, but you know, you can do some addition here on this side, you can do some addition on this side and you can hold it to prevent it from overflowing and it's gonna be working great. So there's like a lot of this kind of like little affordances, little holes to for you to add oil very quickly. So you know, because this is a precision machine, right? You can all look at all these patterns, right? Uh, what gets kind of wild, so you know, you have all of these affordances, right? What gets, what gets, what gets kind of wild is that uh, actually, if you, if you wanna consider touch typing or touch calculating, this is kind of far, right? This movement here, if you're going from one to nine is kind of far. So people who are doing it for a living got so good that they would, for example, take uh, Ethan's, or I will take Ozok uh, numbers, 27, 18, right? They would in their head decouple it into, let's say, 25, 15, and they would add 30, whatever, right? So they would split it into two numbers that were all in this part of the keyboard, just in their heads, because that was easier to move, your, to do it twice, but move your fingers minimally in this part, rather than do it once, and then, but move your fingers far, which is exactly the sort of how we got keyboards that we have today, right? Which is like limited movement. And for example, instead of having lowercase and uppercase, which is what typewriters do, you have a shift because it's easier, even though it's more complicated to hold shift and do those fingers, it's faster, right? So that was this kind of interesting thing. So if I take this and put it on the side, you start seeing actually calculators like this one which they actually don't even have six, seven, eight, nine, right? There are like more portable calculators and they rely on you knowing how to, you know, split a number that has digits six, seven, and a nine into two numbers, right? Have you looked inside how heavy it is, four kilograms? I have no idea, it's pretty heavy. I haven't looked inside because I would be afraid of like messing it up, but it's not that hard. If you look up Comptometer inside on the web, you probably find some interesting features. It's very dense and it's very heavy because I think there's a lot of stuff going on in there. But yeah, so this is like a more, you can kind of clearly see it's a more modern version. It's still a lot of metal, but you know, it's it feels like, this feels like late 19th century. This is probably like 20, uh, 1920s, 1930s. Actually, it's a British one, it actually has <laughs> uh, oh, it's not British. Uh, why did I think it's British? I think the company might be British. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, it has <laughs> it has uh, uh, its owner uh, listed on the site still, and it's basically the same principle, right? Uh, 
you know, the, the digits are like a little bit for front facing. Um, the digits are also colored, some of them are yellow to kind of match the thing here, which is an improvement over this one. Um, but basically, yeah, this is like a portable unit for people who know, uh, you know, how to use it, right? And the last thing I wanted to show you, and it's harkens back to the Tommy, right? So we're gonna, so we have this old comptometer and this one, and again, they're all professional devices, right? And they're all pretty expensive, actually. Again, like early typewriters, they're like precise machinery, high tech stuff. So if I put it aside, oh my God, it's heavy. Might be the heaviest one I have. Um, Let's let's get let's keep this small one here because it's actually gonna keep in the frame. But um, if you wanted to actually be a professional comptometer, comptometrist, calculator, do it for a living, you would not be allowed near this machine initially. You would be issued a comptometer educator, which is a like a keyboard of the calculator without anything else. So basically you had to practice all of these things, maybe even for weeks, I don't know, before you got allowed near a real calculator. Um, because those things were expensive. They're, you know, like people didn't want to waste time training on a real machine or maybe even risk damaging it. So you would get this whole thing, which would like show you, you know, how to, how to use it, give you exercises, and you don't even see results right here because there's nothing working. But the keyboard, you know, you can practice your hand position, you can practice the thing that I just described, which is splitting the number into two, you can practice multiplication, division, all of this kind of stuff in a rudimentary way. And only when you were like good enough, you would be allowed near a machine, which I think is kind of interesting, right? And, and you kind of see it over and over again uh, in history, um, Here's, uh, yeah, the Tommy Comptometer, yeah, exactly. And here's another one I wanted to show you, which is even funnier, although it might be harder to understand. Um, there used to be this very complicated machine called a linotype. It's again, uh, kind of like, I think late 19th century, early 20th century, like this very professional typesetting machine, which actually molded metal inside. And it was extreme, like, it was, you know, the size of a small elevator and it was, uh, you know, almost dangerous to use if you didn't know how to use it. And it came with this keyboard uh, that I happen to have, in a way. Uh, it's a very strange looking keyboard. It's not like, su like super ergonomic, um, but this is the training keyboard from a linotype, right? So again, you would not be allowed in a linotype because actually linotype could probably kill you if you didn't know how to use it, right? But um, but uh, this is a, a training keyboard for Linotype, and this is basically a typesetting machine, right? So you can see, like, it doesn't have a shift. This is a little bit broken, but like, it's lowercase right here, uppercase right here, and all sorts of digits and stuff, and even like typographical characters like end space, thin space, all that kind of stuff, and a space bar on the side, and that's it. Like, this is a. Oh, somebody actually used the Linotype. So perfect. Maybe you can tell us some of your experiences uh, in a chat, but basically, you know, this is just like pieces of metal. There's like nothing smart about it. But again, you would get to use the layout uh, and you would just practice those things um, uh, for a while until, you know, you were kind of certified to use the actual linotype. Um, and the funny thing is you can see here, the ordering is kind of thoughtful, but kind of strange because it actually follows the most common letter in the English language, right? Like in, but in this particular weird order, right? So, you know, often your hand would be sort of here, operated on the left-hand side, and maybe a little bit here, or well, actually here, right, on this side, because this is lowercase. But, uh, you know, uh, A, O, and you can see like some of the vowels are here, right? The same from the first keyboard that we looked at. Um, yeah, uh, some people are mentioning that you can still see Linotype in some museums. Uh, well, maybe not now, but eventually when they all reopen. Uh, there's one in LA as well. Um, but uh, yeah, this is like, uh, this is again a training keyboard for Linotype. You know, you kind of don't see that anymore, right? I also have a, uh, uh, I, I have a few like this, but we can move on right now. But basically it's, 
it's uh, uh, yeah thanks Fema thanks for showing up uh, uh, we're not gonna get much longer probably like maybe half more hour if, if this seems interesting to you I have like what well, I have the Soviet keyboard I want to show you uh, but you know basically uh, yeah, there's no, Jeff is mentioning, there's no backspace even, right? Like in this keyboard uh, or any of those keyboards really, right? Because backspace is complicated or like, I mean, typewriters had a backspace, but it was just like backing up a space. It wasn't delete, it wasn't undo, right? That came much later with computers. All of this, you had to be really good. And just basically the assumption is like, you would not make mistakes. That's why you have all of these training keyboards to practice not making mistakes. And there was somebody asked before, like the oddest part about that to me is that it's training without any kind of feedback. If you were continually pressing the wrong keys, how would you know? Um, that's a good question. I think it's actually surprising how much, uh, if you start like touch typing and learning, how much your brain and your sort of muscles collaborate to actually make you feel like you made a mistake like without even realizing, right? Like if you notice yourself, and it's really hard to tell you to notice it because then you're paying attention, but the moment you start touch typing or close to touch typing, you you reach to you reach for backspace without even thinking about it, right? Your finger is like, oh, I didn't land on the right key or something felt off. And it very quickly, like modern memory makes you reach for backspace without your brain even registering on a conscious level you made a mistake, which is like a wonderful thing. And it would make touch typing much faster. Um, but none of this had it, right? Uh, if you made a mistake, uh, on this one, you have to reset it, start from scratch. If you make a mistake on a linotype, you have to like throw a line, throw it away, and then maybe hope somebody catches it later uh, because it was actually somebody else's job to put those lines in text and have them printed. Uh, uh, for typewriters, if you made a typo, you pretty much start from scratch. If you made a typo the last line of the page and your document was presentational, you basically have to start typing in, which is which explains why word processor and all of this were such a revolution because they saved people from like basically decades of mindless retyping uh, of pages uh, when they make a typo, and that's why we don't have to care so much for typos today, right? Because the stakes are much lower. All of us are like professional typists in a way, but also a all of us are like not professional typists, right? We use typing casually. We talk to people. We program. Like of course, some people use type still for many, many hours a day, but it's much less common if you look at cross-section of everybody who uses keyboards. Okay, um, what else? Uh, maybe the last thing I wanted to show you, uh, and by the way, let me know if you wanna do more of those. <laughs> like, or, you know, um, uh, I'm just curious if this is interesting to anybody, like if those demos are fun. I have like a lot more keyboards. I'm still holding like really cool stuff for the next time, but you tell me if this seems fun and, and or maybe the newsletter is easier or some other stuff. But, okay, so we're gonna move those things aside. And, uh, you know, all of these training keyboards. Um, do, 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 do. Little educator here. Um, Um, I need to tell you something you probably already know about, which is, you know, what some people call the best keyboard ever made, um, which is um, IBM Model M from mid 1980s, and it's basically um, <laughs> yes, 100 and 150 keyboards. Yeah. I mean, some of them are kind of like, you know, less, less interesting than the others, but um, um, here's, uh, you know, some people call it the best keyboard ever made. It's, you know, the keyboard that has this like very clicky buckling springs um, is the keyboard that has this layout that became the standard layout after it was introduced. Um, and it's a keyboard, like for a while, it was like the only good mechanical keyboards you could get, right? Because in the nineties, there was this like drought of mechanical keyboards um, or good, good feeling keyboards. Um, and uh, I kind of lied to you in a way because um, I have a real Model M somewhere and I can pull it up. Although it looks exactly the same. This is a strange Model M that's actually buckling springs. It sounds bad. It feels bad. It's still better than a lot of keyboards. Uh, I just forgot I had it. Uh, it's uh, apparently IBM made some Model M's that were like cheaper and 
not as glorious as most of the other ones, which is like a don't tell people who love Model M's, <laughs> maybe. Um, but this is like a rubber dome, shitty version of Model M that looks like a real thing, which I think is kind of fun. Uh, and you can tell because the, those secondary legends are black. And I think on the real keyboard, uh, Model M, they're like lighter. So FYI. But you know, this is like a proper good feeling keyboard, right? Like this is what used to be like the golden standard. Um, David is asking about Apple Extended 2. Uh, yeah, I think Apple Extended 2 stole a lot of things from this keyboard, like, you know, the layout, actually some of the legends and stuff. But uh, I think Apple Extended is only Max, right? So I think that sort of narrows it down to a much smaller group of people. Um, but yeah, there was like maybe in a world of the PCs, the big one was Model M, Apple Extended 2. Still, some people still swear by Apple Extended 2 today. It's a keyboard from 87, I believe. Uh, well, uh, Apple Extended 1 is from 87. I don't know, uh, 2 is maybe a little bit later. But, uh, or maybe I'm wrong. Correct me, tell me what is the date of Apple Extended because I don't remember, but I think it's late 80s or early 90s. But basically, so this is sort of what you expect from like a good keyboard, right, of that time. So this is, you know, a good layout. It just feels, you know, it's elegant, right? It's like a classic IBM. It's it's heavier than most keyboard. It's It can survive you and your kids probably, right? It's so good. So, of course, like, you know, there were other keyboards and I will show you another one. Um, um, there are many that I have that kind of look like this one, right? So this is like a ch slightly cheaper feeling um, version. It's like more mushy. Let's see if we can get a kick up and see what's happening inside it. Oh. Yeah, it looks, I actually have no idea what this means. <laughs> if somebody knows what this is, because I'm not like a key switch expert. I'm sorry if it's a little bit dirty. Uh, you tell me what it is, but you know, it doesn't feel great. Um, so, you know, th there was definitely like a gradient of keyboards, uh, in the 80s and 90s, right? So like Model M maybe was a really good one. There were some that were like a little bit cheaper, a little bit like worse feeling. By the way, this is a keyboard for a word processor, not for like a computer. Um, and uh, so you can see, for example, that it has a bunch of like really interesting keys. Like here it says overtype, which is, you can flip it to, I'm sorry I cannot connect it because it has like strange protocol, but you know, it's sort of like a version of an insert key that we kind of forgot about, but you can you can use it like a typewriter or you can use it as a computer, right? Depending on, and it even has a little light. Uh, you can see that the tab is very prominent, which is kind of a, a typewriter word processor convention. It has code for like word processor shortcuts. And you know, it has a go, which I think is really cool. It has all of this navigation for different words and paragraphs and columns and stuff like that. Uh, and it, you know, it doesn't have the arrow keys here because it has them here already. So it's a bunch of like, you know, interesting keys, but I'm showing it mostly to show you like, you know, this is kind of like a worse version of Model M, right? It's, it's kind of like, eventually we'll see like a Dell keyboard, HP keyboards, that kind of stuff. But the one that I have that I really want to show you, and you maybe saw it already in my newsletter, um, is this Soviet keyboard or like, uh, I th well, it's a keyboard from Ukraine after uh, uh, the Soviet Union fell, just not, not so long uh, after, but it's, uh, I'm sort of imagining it was made still in a Soviet bloc, you know, uh, it's how it started. And it's this like really horrible quality keyboard that took all the shortcuts, no pun intended, to just arrive at something that's like very cheap um, and very bad looking and very bad feeling. Um, and I can, you know, I can tell you a little bit about it, but it's also like, I'm Polish originally, right? I grew up in like Polish Poland. So in a way it kind of like reminds me really of home, like this sort of like shoddy materials and all of this kind of bad feeling and this like cutting corners, like, uh, uh, whatever's possible to make it happen. Like uh, that kind of resonates with me in a weird way that I just want to share with you. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it definitely has like a, a, 
uh, Latin and uh, Cyrillic lab labels and, and legends here. So that's definitely like a, an, an improvement, right, in a way. But first of all, you can sort of see how bad it already feels and looks, right? Like the keys have, uh, like, they, they're not great shapes. I think they're shapes from the machinery rather than shapes designed for human fingers, right? Um, there's, um, there's, like, you can see that, like, no key is exactly straight. No legend is, like, aligned with the other ones. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there's, uh, for example, like, all of these keys that you can see here, with the exception of space bar, which is also, like, very wobbly, which is funny. Um, all of these bigger keys are what is what we call, like, stepped keys. They have all of this, like, uh, small islands, uh, and then there's like places that you're not supposed to touch, which is weird, right? And the reason for this is that uh, if you have a big key or a long key, you have to stabilize it, right? You have to do something, maybe a rod, maybe a multiple mounting points, that it feels okay whatever you press, whether you press it on side or in the middle, because that's what we do, right? When we move quickly through the keyboard, we just we're not very careful about where we press the key. And if you don't know how to do it, then if you press it like here, look what's happening. <laughs> this is actually kind of broken a little bit, but you can imagine that like every key that's not stabilized properly is gonna do something like this. And it feels poor, like it feels horrible, right? So to solve it in a very cheap way, you just force people to press it in the middle by making it shorter. So I'm not gonna press it here and then make it like do this, right? You just press it in the middle, which is like, again, you know, like the comptometer puts a lot of honors on the person. This is kind of like a version of this many, many decades later. Look at how the uh, LEDs are mounted. They're basically just regular LEDs without any housing, without any like, see, like any plastic that lets them see through like all of these modern keyboards do. Uh, they're just like LEDs on the <laughs> printed circuit. <laughs> I think it's just like just funny like it's sort of like you can laugh at it because it's so bad you can also kind of admire the tenacity it's just like we have to make a keyboard we have so little resources it's like it's like a b-movie like a budget movie right it's just like some of them are horrible but also somebody made a movie I don't know it, like look how they have to move all of this here to make to leave room for an LED <laughs> they have to move all of these keys here presumably because the space bar they didn't, couldn't manufacture space bar long enough to make it. It's just so good. I don't know. Uh, you can barely read it, like, here, because it's already fading away, and it's, like, all, like, it's bad plastics. I think the comptometer plastics that I had from, like, 19th century might be better than this. Um, I'm not a plastic expert. But anyway, this is such a cool keyboard. Um, uh, you can flip it aside. You can see what it says. I think it's 93 if I can read it correctly, right? So it's it's actually like six or seven years older than modern. Look look how I, I don't know if this is like it's been through things or it's just made this poorly. Um but I don't know. I kinda like this. Um and Pan! You're I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. You actually like queuing up exactly what I wanted to talk about, which is perfect. So we have this, so we had the Model M, we had the bad Model M, but of course they're good Model Ms. Uh, maybe we took a look at them next time. And we had all the way to like this, the worst 101 clone that I've ever seen. And I kind of have it in my collection and it's, uh, I don't know, it's, oh look at the key just got stuck. It's kind of cool. It has the XT80 um, connection. I don't know why I didn't unpack this, but so it's actually possible to use. I don't have the right converter, but you know, one day maybe I will use it. And um, David is asking what other objects from your childhood were like this. Um, everything. Like, we had a Soviet TV that was not working correctly. We had like a bad cassette player, um, uh, toys, or even playgrounds. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm not gonna ask, like. Oh, like poor Marcin grew up in like harsh. No, <laughs> I, I had a pretty, I have an upper middle class upbringing in Poland. I, I have great free education that like kind of got me where I am today. So I'm not complaining. It just was the reality of it. But, uh, you know, I had like a bad calculator from um, um, Soviet Union uh, that actually smelled really funny, which is not something I can convey here. This, how does this smell? Here we go. This is, this is a, 
Don't take a screenshot right now. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna smell it on camera. No, it's actually not bad. I don't know. I expected something more, more horrible. Um, but yeah, there's this sort of like uh, joke in. I think there was a joke in Soviet Union saying like, here's the specification for an object you're making, and then under material it was basically whatever's available, <laughs> like whatever plastic metal you have, just got get it this one, right? This is a whole story here about you know the sort of five-year plans of Poland and Soviet Union and stuff. We're gonna move past this because I'm not an expert, but like. Ah, this is so bad and also so good in a way, from my heart. So, the last thing I wanted to show you, and this is something that Pan, I'm sorry if I'm saying the name wrong, uh, just queued up, was this sort of idea of um, uh, keyboard uh, thing. Give me a second, I don't know if you can hear me, but um, I'm just gonna grab all of this, and here we go. Oops, spoiler alert. Um, so let's let's pull up the keyboard again here. You know, this is the same kind of fake Model M, but it doesn't matter. And the one kind of like amazing thing about uh, the keyboards is, uh, at least from personal computers, is that um, you start seeing function keys, right? And you start seeing very generic labels on things that, you know, even enter key is kind of like. Is it really entering things? What is tab? You know, like um, uh, once you start seeing a lot of software, it's very hard to make a keyboard that's very truthful, right? It's kind of promising what, uh, you know, this keyboard doesn't say control C is copy anywhere because it doesn't have to be copy, right? Even though or com control Z is undo because it doesn't have to be undo. It can be whatever in different applications. And that's why it makes it really hard to, to understand what your keyboard is doing. Maybe for the first time, in history, right? Like every other, most other keyboard that came before were specialized, right? This word processor keyboard that I showed you had like very specific keys for overtype. Um, this one insert could do whatever you want, right? So you also start seeing keyboards arriving with function keys, which basically is like whatever software you're using or whatever, whoever you want it to happen, you can redefine them, right? And that's why you see all of these like modifier keys and keyboard shortcuts that are not described on a key that described in a menu on a screen, or sometimes they're described in, uh, in this overlay. And I wanted to show you just a few fun overlays. Uh, so this was pretty common. This is for a video game, Command 4. And basically this, this, you know, this helps you understand uh, what, this key do, what those key do uh, in this particular context if you launch that game. Right, so here's this one that's fly by camera. This one is, I don't know, I never played this game. Screenshot. But uh, not only you see this different software manufacturers doing that, you also see the keyboard manufacturers, like, like Pan mentioned, leaving room for all sorts of things like this. So this was, you know, you see this reach right here. You can put something on it if you wanna like, if you have another, I think I have one here maybe. Yeah, here we go. Uh, I have like a small collection uh, and a, like, you know, maybe you put something here and then you can refer to it, right? You can be like, oh, it's shift F1, right? Uh, and it's all you can see, it's all like lining up with those keys, right? Because it's, it's, it's very carefully designed to help you. Uh, so this is like physical set of interfaces to kind of like help you uh, navigate those different apps until, you know, they become motor memory. So like this is another one for a different kind of keyboard where you can actually write whatever you want those keys to be, right? Or whatever they are in your application. So this is like a generic overlay. And this is when function keys were on the side. Uh, there's another one for a game. Oh, here we go, no. There's another one for a game that I, um, this is for Commodore 64, I think. So I don't have that computer with me, but basically it like overlays on the, to on the whole keyboard, right? And here's function keys. And it can only tell you about the keys that are like around the periphery, which is like, I think really funny, but like space becomes emergency stop. So there's like a whole era of this kind of stuff appearing. And, and I wanna show you, you know, this is like another one, uh, another word perfect thing. You can just place it on the top of the keyboard and, you know, just like look it up. And you even got like sometimes extra keys with like uh, dots that you would put, color dots that you would put on control alt, so you can match them by color as well. Um, Swen, you, I had one of these for Deluxe Paint. I think I have one of these too. Give me a second. Oh my God. Um, oh, 
I don't know if this is exactly what you had, but this is actually, I didn't unpack it. It's mint in a, well, it's so kind of mint. It's the Lux Paint 4 version and it's, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. You can like overlay it on the Amiga keyboard, which you can see has the different shape of the function keys, right? Only two clusters and it gets you like a lot more information here about some specific shortcuts, you know? So yeah, there's this whole sort of industry for a while. It's, it's went away right now, but the two kind of most interesting artifacts that I want to show you about uh, this is one is you can take it pretty far. So this is another Commodore 64 overlay and it's basically like a physical overlay, right? So uh, this is for like a music program uh, that you could buy and it came with this thing you can put on top of the keyboard and it doesn't just help you understand the keyboard. It actually helps you turn the keyboard into something else, in which case a kind of bad feeling piano, <laughs> right? But, uh, you know, so there's this whole like universe of like when when the moment keyboards became generic we kind of wanted to make them more specific right for particular use cases right so this is really funny to me and, and of course like on your iphone those distinctions disappeared because like every keyboard can be specific again but it's also a generic device so you, you know it, 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 software again changes things like this but here we go uh, bb oh my god pan check this out i have one for you too if i can find it um, yeah, this is one for BBC, maybe Master, not Micro. Yeah, BBC Master. It's a British computer. Um, yeah, kind of, kind of worn down a little bit. And I don't know what how you're supposed to use it. You probably like place it like this on top, like make a little triangle. Anyway, I'm like really, really fascinated by this because there are kind of like, um, a kind of. Um, you know, they, they talk about the story of keyboards becoming this everyday tool that changes its meaning because of software, right? Which only happened like maybe in the 70s, 80s, 90s, right? This is like, and it shows like how keyboards keep changing still, right? Even though the key, keyboards, QWERTY keyboards are like 150 years old, they keep changing. So yeah, so the last thing I want to show is really funny. So here's the box, yeah, let me show you. The, I actually control this, ob uh, camera switching with my feet, which is why I have to look where my feet are. And this is kind of interesting, right? It says a full length folding template and mini manual. And it's really funny. Yeah. Uh, I got so excited when I saw it on eBay because I actually had no idea this existed. So here we go. I just unpacked it. And so you unfold it and you place it on your keyboard like this. As you can see, it has all of this. It, it's, it's pretty rigid, right? It's like rigid plastic. Place it here. And it tells you about MS-DOS or DOS. I don't know if it's Microsoft or otherwise, but uh, it's, it again, it comes with like, you know, like helps you understand function keys. It has like a bunch of commands and stuff you can learn you can you know we have a reference here but it also comes with a book <laughs> which i find like kind of delightful updated for 4.0 and you can actually like read a book <laughs> which i think is like sort of extreme version of this idea right it's basically like maybe computers were not good enough for help screen yet help screens yet and internet didn't exist so you couldn't look it up so it was like the best idea it was just like well uh, you could have a book drying next to a computer, but that's like heavy and not fun. So we're gonna have this like keyboard, what I would call a keyboard book, <laughs> uh, uh, which I think is kind of funny. I don't know. It's like very, uh, I find it very delightful. I don't, I don't know if it was useful. I don't know if people liked it, um, but I finding all of these like things in my research, all of this like weird side journeys, like, you know, the Singapore keyboard, uh, all of this like, people trying new things and the sort of world of keyboards becoming this uh, this kind of, it's its its, its own universe, right? It's its own uh, like kind of place where different people can engage with keyboards in many different ways and make weird products or great products or make weird software or great software and all of that kind of stuff. And that kind of never goes away. And you know, today I didn't show much of it. Maybe the last keyboard I can show is just my keyboard. And uh, and we'll finish there. Um, 
and I will kind of make a confession to you, which also might be important. So, um, I don't remember what keyboard it is or what switches I'm using. <laughs> like, uh, like I'm really like inspired by a lot of people like uh, uh, doing uh, mechanical keyboards and investing in them. And you know, some of you are actually in the chat. Like, uh, um, you know, it's there's just so much great creativity there in terms of keycaps, in terms of key switches, in terms of layouts, in terms of like production value, in terms of software that runs them, in terms of like keyboards and as, as a means of artistic expression. Um, I, I'm not like super on top of that universe, to be honest, and I'm not like a mechanical keyboard like expert or aficionado, uh, but I like in some way admire many people who are because it's like it's such a wealth like it's such a such a rich universe, right? So, um, the one thing that I know, so I have this like fun, you know, what it's called like an artisanal switch. Um, I just kind of like it. It's pretty. Um, uh, it was I think the I got it a long time ago. I forgot who made it. I think this keyboard is Hex Gears Gemini. I like it. I don't know. I like this layout definitely. Uh, actually, I did. I I've heard. Uh, I read some research uh, that says the layout is more important than switches, which I think a lot of people would disagree <laughs> with. But I, I like this sort of shorter layout, but I don't like when it's too short because I need arrow keys, basically. I like the uh, the, the keycaps are SA, that's the profile I think called, and it's like the old school like IBM terminals, like very tall, uh, if you look at them, um, let me see here, if you look at them, is my camera gonna refocus or is it too hard? Here we go. Uh, look how, t oh my God, this one is dirty. Don't don't look at the dirty one. Uh, look how tall they are. I kind of like them. It's just partly like nice for my fingers. Partly there's also a bit of history here. Um, I like blunt keycaps because it's uh, it's just kind of cool. I don't know. <laughs> like I, I mostly remember of these keys by now because uh, I've been typing for a while, not to brag. <laughs> <laughs> like probably everybody who's typing in a channel can say the same thing. Um, uh, and and the switches, um, maybe you can actually tell me, um, I can actually do it without. So here, I actually got kind of lazy and I it's hot swappable. So those are the main ones that I use are the yellow ones and they're linear, but I got lazy and I didn't switch all of them. So some of them are like the older ones, the box, uh, I think they're box browns or something. So, you know, I'm not dismissive of like the switch, uh, the art and science of making good switches. I just, I just like them. I for, kind of forgot what they are. <laughs> uh, uh, I hope that's okay to say it doesn't uh, remove my credibility. Oh, I see the wrong thing, the wrong layer. Anyway, so uh, uh, how are you switching cameras, foot pedals? Well, here's the funny thing. Um, this might be like a fun way to finish because, uh, you know, like I, uh, yeah, it's one and a half hours. I'm, um, I'm not, I try not to be like very pretentious about those things, just it's in my nature. Uh, so uh, the, uh, you know, I'm sort of pragmatic by nature and kind of like blue color in some weird way. So, uh, uh, so I think a lot of what I wanna do is just like, let's put keyboards to good use. So I'm gonna show you exactly what I'm doing uh, to switch cameras. Um, so, this is a keyboard that I bought a long time ago. It's a very cheap keyboard. Uh, it actually has like Lego or Lego-like inserts. You can put Lego figures on it for some reason. I think I bought it in Japan. It's, there's nothing great about it. I just use Carabiner to remap like all of these keys to F1 and all of this keys to F2, and I think this for F3, although I don't use it right now, and I'm literally putting this under my feet. So this was under my feet the whole time. <laughs> I'm wearing socks, so like hopefully it's not like very gross or whatever. <laughs> but So basically I was just like mashing this left side and mashing this right side. So again, it's like you can buy professional devices to do this, but I'm just like, I have all of these weird keyboards lying around. I'm just gonna do something with them. So uh, so this is kind of my story. <laughs> this is me not being very 
pretentious with this keyboard, it's just like having it do its work. So not very glamorous, I'm using my feet, but it's fun. It's also fun because like keyboards can be a lot of things, as I mentioned to people. They can be like objects of affection or expression, or it can be like historical artifacts. This is the way I'm uh, uh, kind of, I love them. And it just could be like pedestrian stuff that you just put to use and you're not very, you're not very careful about them because there's a lot of just cheap keyboards now. And, and so I like that. And I hope in my book, let me just switch to my face for closing, <laughs> closing ceremony. Um, yeah, I hope that my book gives justice to basically all of the, um, all of the kinds of things people find interesting in keyboards or they have found interesting in, in the past. Because that also keeps changing, right? Keyboards, like we, sh we, we looked at the computer and like how different keyboards felt back then, right? They were like metal, professional, expensive, heavy, and they almost never feel like this today. Um, but, uh, and the journey of like how keyboards went to, from the very beginnings to where they are today, um, it's just like really cool. It's really fascinating that we change next to keyboards, keyboards change themselves. And at the same time, it's literally like still QWERTY, right? Like if you look at this thing, it's still QWERTY. This is the same layout as the first like modern typewriter, which is kind of wild, right? So, so, so I talk about this, what do I press here? Here we go. So, um, fun hack for the foot pedals. Okay, I'm gonna switch quickly. I'm gonna look quickly at the chat. Thank you so much, Ethan. I can't wait for my book either. Uh, the current plan is next year, somewhere in the middle. I actually have a timeline. You know, I'm very nervous about talking about timelines because I haven't done this before. And I don't want to like give like a specific deadline and then blow past it many, many times, right? And it's turned into like, a very complex project. But we have a timeline now that basically goes from here to like sort of maybe the Kickstarter or whatever I'm going to do starts in March and hopefully gets released in May and June. So that's my current plan. Please don't hold, well, well hold me accountable, but don't, please be gentle because I'm still figuring it out and I still haven't properly announced it, but I just got paper samples that are right there. Um, the, the book is most, like it's pretty much written. Oh, I can show you. Are you interested in seeing something? I don't know. This is the, pr the last prototype I did and it's, you know, and it has pretty much all, most that it's needed. It has, a lot of photos, a lot of like really cool stuff going on. Uh, the text is here. The the typography is finished here. You can see. Oh, damn! I can see. I can show you the Linotype machine. <laughs> this is people using the Linotype machine, and this is a, you know a proper Linotype keyboard, and this is kind of the, oh, this is how the machine looks. So it's a huge, heavy industrial machine, right? And with this keyboard right here. So, you know, so uh, the key, the book is ready. It's almost ready, right? But uh, still need to, um, here's a really cool, very messy IBM keyboard. A lot of photos. I, th I hope a lot of really cool stuff inside that's, uh, that's, you know, here we can, this is the end of the first volume and we sort of starting to see early com personal computers and some of you might recognize some of them. So a lot of cool spreads. This is the Commodore 64 that I don't have, but I was talking about. Anyway, um, stay tuned. Uh, please subscribe to the newsletter if you're not already. Tell me how you felt about all of this. Uh, let me switch to my face. Um, if you want to do more of this, it's always fun. I have a lot of keyboards and now I kind of know a little bit how the YouTube thing works. Um, and yeah, and uh, thank you all of you. And I recognize some of your names and I don't recognize some of them, but thank you so much for your support. It's been like a, a, a long journey and I, you know, I really want to make something that I'm happy with and people would enjoy. And I think, I think there's something there that I think everybody would find something really interesting in. And it's a book kind of unlike any books that I found, but, uh, oh yeah, I have this line that I book somewhere there actually. Um, but um, uh, there, uh, do you talk about, uh, where can we back the book? Oh, I see new questions. Okay. Um, just when I think I'm done, people are really uh, putting interesting questions. Where can we back the book? Nowhere yet. But, you know, as I said, the current plan is to do start a campaign or some sort of pre-order system, maybe in March. So if you subscribe to my newsletter, um, you, uh, you will not, or Twitter, 
you will know when it's ready because I've got to be very loud about it. So that's that's my advice right now. Um, um, Pani, you were not chatting at all. I really appreciate it. I actually mentioned it very early on when there were a few people just like, type on chat. This is fun for me. I don't see you. It's, it's a weird kind of asymmetry, but I really enjoy when people chatting. So thank you so much. Let's do another one of those at some point. I am talking about non-Latin oriented keyboards. I have chapters about Chinese keyboards, Japanese keyboards, Turkish keyboards, Polish keyboards, a bunch of them, uh, both typewriters and computers. So there's gonna be, there's a lot of really cool stuff there. Uh, there's basically, yeah, every chart app has a lot of good stuff, I hope. So if you subscribe to the newsletter, we're gonna continue, I'm gonna continue talking about it. I tell you about the process, tell you about what it's like, yeah, and we'll be there soon. Hope, keep your fingers crossed, send me good vibes or whatever. Uh, if you're writing a book or thinking of writing a book or have already written a book, good for you. This is really hard. This is very complex, uh, but I hope the end result is worth it. And with that, again, thank you so much. Let's do it again and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Um, and I think I will just press end stream right now. I've never done this before, but I think that's how it works. So thank you so much again for your support and bye. Bye. This is weird, it's like ending a Zoom call, you just wave and it's super awkward. Bye. Thank you. Bye.